Walker. We are joined by our property player this morning, Dune Real Estate Partners CEO Daniel Nidick. Uh, before starting Dune, Daniel led Goldman Sachs's real estate department. Also with me here is Dominic Chu, and I know you two have been on panels before sure, absolutely. Uh, on real estate. Right. And uh, Dan, first off, I mean, it seemed that Tom was much more optimistic that we were in a recovery here in the housing market. Are you, right. are, are you you're less optimistic about that, right? right? I, I, think, I think that, you know, it's a question of, of of at what level does the economy and the housing market come back? I think that we think we're in a, we think we've bottomed out. I think it's just a question of sort of what is the amplitude of the recovery. Mm -hmm. Now, if you look at the overall picture, going into residential properties right. is a lot different in terms of the management and expertise yes. than managing commercial properties. Right. What, is, what, what, is the, what is the headwind, the hurdle for, for going into residential property landlording, basically? Right. Well, and of course, you have to, you're, you're talking about single-family residential properties. Sure. Obviously, the apartment market is, is pretty strong in, in a lot of markets, but I think the, the question is, what is it going to be like to run a large portfolio of single-family homes? You don't have the economies of scale that you have. You know, it's not like you have 250 units in an apartment house where you can have one manager. What yeah. does it mean to actually run it? What does it mean to have people in those homes? And, and a lot of people are looking at this opportunity, and they think it's a pretty reasonable opportunity, but there are unknowns that none of us have dealt with before. So you're not as interested in, in bidding for these foreclosed properties that Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac will, you know, will we're, be we're, auctioned? Well, and it's not only, it's on, it's not only Fannie and Freddie, it's the, it's the banks who have a lot of this right. also. And so there's a question of, do you want to do it through the government? Do you want to do it more through the, the private owners? Uh, and, and we are looking at it, but we do have these questions, and we're probably not as bullish about it as some others. Well, I was going to say the commercial side of things is a very different story, like you right. said, with the apartment complexes and everything. Right. But with the commercial side, there are opportunities to be had. We've, heard, we've, heard, we've sure. heard a number of real estate players say that. Betty has talked to a number that say that there are opportunities in distressed areas. Right. Where are you seeing all of those opportunities right. emerge here? Right. And I, and I think we continue to see a lot of that. We see a lot of it with the banks. We see it with the special servicers. Uh, we see it with the borrowers trying to do recap. So you still have, at least in the real estate world and especially in the commercial real estate world, a vastly over leveraged system and working out that leverage creates opportunities. Okay, let me um, play for you uh, something that Jeff Blau of Related sure. Companies, which of course they're, they're mostly in, um, in commercial, uh, right. and some residential. Though more residential. Actually, they're more residential, though, though they are doing the, the uh, you know, Big the, Hudson, the Hudson, Hudson Yards Yard project. Which a, reasonable, huge, huge. a reasonable commercial deal. <laughs> I, I, I would say, um, you know, right. but, but, but if you think of their real business, which they've been doing over the last X years, they've been probably the largest player in residential and, and very active in it. But well, anyway, but, go ahead. Well, this is what Jeff has to say sure. about the New York property market. Technology companies are also leading, fueling huge growth in New York City as well. Right. So we're seeing West Chelsea booming because of technology companies, and that's, that's something relatively new for New York and something that could really change the dynamics of office space in New York. Would you agree with that, that technology would do that? Well, I think that, you know, technology and social media are changing certain areas of New York that historically were not strong commercial areas and have become much stronger. And I think that certainly that's true in Chelsea, certainly it's true in parts of the West Village and maybe parts of, of uh, Tribeca. And, uh, you know, whether that how that impacts the rest of New York City is, is a question. It's also not just about New York City, though. It, it's also about the sure. United States and Western Europe. Th these are two places that you've concentrated your efforts. Right. Why just in the U.S. and Western Europe? And, right. and wh what are the opportunities that you see there? Right. And, and I think, well, first of all, you know, we always have a little bit of a sense that, and, and certainly at Goldman, we did a lot of emerging market types of things. Uh, you know, I think our feeling is we understand the U.S., we understand Western Europe. Uh, we always worry a little bit about what we don't know. You know, we, we don't know what we don't know when we go into some of these emerging markets. We understand the economies. We understand the, the currency issues, the tax issues. Um, we, we have a pretty good feel for what we don't know and what we know, and I think that that's what makes us more comfortable there. And I would say today our, our, um, our focus is much more on the U.S., where obviously we even have greater knowledge and we don't have uh, the euro question that you guys were just talking about a moment ago. So right, right now I would say that by far the majority of our focus is on the U.S. and the opportunities in the U.S., which we think are still pretty extraordinary. So where's the biggest opportunity in the United States? Right, and again, it's, it's dealing with this leverage issue. It's dealing with the leverage issue that the banks are dealing with, that borrowers are dealing with, and that the special servicers are dealing with. And, you know, basically what you have are properties that are still pretty significantly over leveraged. 
there has to be a write-off of debt. There has to be new equity injected. Um, you know, I, I happen to also be the chairman of the Real Estate Roundtable, and one of the things that we've been working with in Washington, and that's the lobbying group for, for the real estate industry in Washington, and one of the things we've been working on is this thing called the funding gap, and that is the need for new equity to, uh, to basically create a sustainable capital structure in these properties as they get restructured. So, again, we think of the opportunities as driven by this deleveraging opportunity, which we still see out there, and we think we're going to see it for the next five, six years. Uh, and uh, Dan, I know we were introducing you, you, know, you formerly worked at um, Goldman Sachs. Sure. Um, you're part of the management committee. Right. And you personally had your own reaction to right. Craig Smith's column yes. uh, last week. I actually, week I actually wrote uh, and, Dom and, and on this. And you wrote to yes, Dom. Yes, I did. So what made you want to speak out? Well, you know, I, I guess I thought the interesting question, and, and, and look, there is an issue of, you know, what is the culture and has it changed or hasn't it changed and, and how has management dealt with that culture? But, you know, I thought the interesting question was why was the New York Times giving what was an employee who didn't have a great career? You know, if you're 12 years and you're a vice president at Goldman Sachs, you're not having a great career, and why did the New York Times give him that kind of platform? And I, I thought that was the question. I, I watched well, you guys not? in the morning. If it, it, well, does that mean when the when the first guy from Google is upset and he wants to he wants a large platform in the New York Times, and someone from GM and someone from every great company in America wants to vent and you know and have a three-page column in the, in the op-ed no, page of the New York Times, they're going to give it to him? No, but, but 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 the idea is that Goldman Sachs, right. which has been so much. Uh, you know, such a key player sure. and, and so focused during this financial crisis and, right. and, and the dealings with Abacus and Fabulous Fab and all of that right. and, and the ire that it's created in Washington. Right. You know, the public wants to get a better sense of what is going on inside Goldman Sachs, right? right? Yeah. And so this person was able to do that in, in his own, in the way that he did it. Right. But I don't and know, did the New York Times actually fact check that and determine that this was really the problem? You know, Goldman Sachs sent a number of the uh, former partners a, a rebuttal that said, you know, I don't know, I remember exactly 80, 90 per, 89, 90 percent of the people thought the culture was great. Again, I just don't. But bottom it, line, you you disagreed with his assessment, so. Bottom well, line. one, I don't, I don't, I haven't been there since 2003, so I'm okay. not the right person to comment on the assessment. I was just asking the question of, did the New York Times do the kind of fact checking that I would expect someone to do when they gave someone that kind of platform? And I don't know. And I just that was really the question I was asking, Dom. Sure. You know, why does why does go, why does the New York Times allow someone to have that kind of platform? And and then of course. It goes from the op-ed page and it becomes the front page because the New York Times made news. Well, and is that what the New York Times is supposed it, to be doing? It's not so much the New York Times made news. It, it's that he made news by speaking up. But, you know, we could talk about okay. this. Anyway, that was my, uh, uh, that, uh, that uh, was just on, one person's opinion. Dan, thank you so much. Dan Nydick of Dune Real Estate Partners.